Welcome to The Bridge Online. No matter where you're worshiping from, we are so glad that you're here. We have a great message for you, but before we dive into that, here are your weekly announcements. The weekly hours of the church are gonna be changing at the beginning of February. The new hours will be Tuesday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. That information will always be available on Facebook as well as at thebridge129.org. If you gave last year and you would like to get a contribution statement, you can go online and request yours by January 30th. You can request that on the app at the Welcome Center or at thebridge129.org. Don't forget, small groups will be starting up very soon. Sign-ups will be available in February and groups will begin meeting the first week of March. Well, that's it for our weekly announcements. If you need any more information, you can check out our Facebook page or our website, thebridge129.org. Pastor Doug has an awesome message in store for us today. So grab your Bible, maybe a notebook, and let's hear from the Lord. This morning, glad you're here with us. Today is the end. It's just the last day of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And uh, pray that God has just blessed you abundantly through this season of time. And um, we, we, I think each year we do this. If, if you just have a great testimony of something that God has done through this, maybe something the Lord has shown you or just, just some kind of experience that you've had through the 21 days of prayer and fasting, and you'd like to share that, call the church, get on the website. Um, there's, there's opportunity, go to our Facebook page and just share what God has done, uh, through this 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I'm looking forward to it, but I'm looking forward to, to what the new year has, what 2021 has for us. I don't know about you, but, um, I believe God has great things in store for the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. You believe that? Amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Isaiah chapter 43. Um, I lied last week. I confess that I, it was unwittingly. I didn't do it on purpose. I had every intention of, of going to a new sermon and doing something new. I thought last week was the last in the series of understanding divine correction, but um, by Thursday I realized that I had lied. And so we're, we're just going to go at least one more week. I don't, wanna see, I don't know what we'll preach next week. We'll just preach whatever the Holy Spirit leads us. But this week we're going to stay one more time in understanding divine corrections, part five, um, I feel like the Lord is just really, really preparing it, like really giving us some, I am, I mean, I, I feel like I'm learning, I really do, I feel like I'm growing, and like having revelation and understanding kind of in a little bit at least into what we're seeing and what we're experiencing as, as a society, as a church, and so I pray that you are as well, I, I pray that it's helpful to you, I think it must be if the Holy Spirit wants to continue to stay this way, so um, today is extremely encouraging, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. I, I really feel like, God, maybe this is the, the last of this series, Understanding Divine Correction, and so maybe just we go out in a, with a bang and a real word of encouragement. Isaiah chapter 43, one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture, certainly one of my favorite passages in the book of Isaiah. Let's read it together, verses 1 through 7. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob. And who formed you, O Israel? Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. What an encouraging word from the prophet Isaiah to the people of Israel, considering all that they're dealing with and all that they're going through. Now, what we need to remember this morning is everything that God does has a purpose. So, so if that is a true statement, then that, that rings true 
for the hour and the moment in which we're living right now. The things that sometimes we see happening that we don't fully understand, you have to recognize and I have to understand that God has a purpose. There's a purpose. Everything that God does, everything that God allows, there is purpose behind it. And in the case of Israel, as we've learned over the last few weeks, judgment itself would be used as a cleansing agent. It would be used as a tool by God to remind the nation and the people as a whole that they had a purpose. That was important, and it is important for you and I to understand today. God himself had formed this nation. We we know the history, right? You know the story. You know about this guy by the name of Abraham, Abram at the time, who God speaks to. And he says, I want you to come out of this land, and I'm going to take you into a new land. Remember all of the promises, and I'm going to make of you a great nation. And that nation, of course, would grow to be the nation that we've been studying about for the last few weeks, the nation of Israel. God had great purpose in forming the nation. God would use this seemingly insignificant, small, powerless nation in the the midst of, of much greater nations, he would use this nation to reveal his glory. He, he would take something that to the natural eye was foolish, insignificant, powerless, and he would use that nation that he himself was forming to reveal to the world that there was a God, that there was not a God, but there was one God, one true living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And folks, what we have to understand is that is exactly the same thing that God has in store, the plan for the church of Jesus Christ. Christ formed the church 2000 years ago, seemingly small, insignificant, fearful, uneducated in many ways, un- unprepared for what the world was throwing against it. And for 2000 years by the power of the Holy Spirit, even though there has been harsh and vicious and vile opposition against the church across the globe for centuries, the church of Jesus Christ remains to reveal the glory and honor of the one true God. That's the purpose of the church of Jesus Christ. It's not to build buildings. It's not to have more Sunday school classes. It's not for programs. It is we exist today to reveal to the world around us that there is but one God, one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. And so I really believe with everything in me that God is allowing some things to happen around us in order to cleanse us as well. I I believe that many of the things that we're seeing and the things that we're going to see in the near future are going to be used as it was for Israel. It's going to be used in the church of Jesus Christ to refine us, to remind us of our purpose, to get our attention, to reset our focus. Because the reality is we're starting to realize now in the church, in America, that we need a reset. We need a reboot. We, 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 we need some reminding of what our purpose really is. Because, unfortunately, we've gotten distracted. Now, for some, it's going to be a time where it's just simply going to be a pruning period. As the veil is beginning to pull back as to where true affections are. We are watching now, at a record pace, churches closing across America. And, and, and in many ways, in the natural, that, that, that feels very discouraging. And, and by no means do we... Do we glory in that or are we, are we pleased for that? But, but there has to be someone that rises up and just begins to ask the question, could this be the pruning of God? There are, there are people now fleeing the church. You've heard the memes. You've seen the quotes. on this, And, and, and some are saying, if, if you're discouraged, if your faith is empty, if, if because someone lost an election, you're all of a sudden despondent and discouraged and you can't seem to go through life. Your faith was in the wrong place. And, and so, so God is beginning to reveal where, where true affections really are. Where, where is our true affection? Where is our true devotion? And you see, we, we've lost sight in the American church many times to scriptures in the Old Testament that tell us that God is a jealous God. 
God has, we, we thought in some way, I think, subconsciously that we could serve God and mammon. We could serve God and politics, God and country, God and family. You just think God and career. But the reality is, Scripture is very clear, God has only one position, and that is the position of preeminence. First authority, number one. And so what's happening is, there's just there's there's some pruning, and there is. There's just going to be this this falling away that the scripture speaks about. Before Jesus comes, it says there's going to be a falling away, where where I think I said it last week, where we were just we were convinced that we were just by birth Christian. That that's not biblical. You can't be Christian by birth. You have to be Christian only through experience, through an encounter with Jesus Christ. By faith. And, and, and so what's, what's beginning to happen is that veil, that, that kind of fog of, 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 of weird religion, as I call it, is just, I don't know where it came from. It's, it's the American gospel, and it's starting, that veil is starting to be torn away, and, 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 and some pruning is taking place. And no doubt, for the true church, we're starting to begin to wake up. The true church of Jesus Christ across America is starting to realize, wait a minute, we really do have a purpose on the earth. Now, that is no doubt what happened to Israel. There, there, there's not really much debate about that as we see this progression of events that we've been talking about for the last few weeks that, that God allows this judgment to come, but he ultimately is revealing to them, I have a purpose for your life. You, you, you see, they, they just, if, you just, if you did it in simplest terms, God had this great purpose for this small powerless, insignificant nation to reveal his glory because he was going to be their protector. He was going to be their, he was going to be their provider. He was, he was going to cause them to flourish, to be healthy, to, to begin to be fruitful when there was no reason for them to be. They're in a desert. Have you ever, like, have you ever looked at Israel? It's like it, it shouldn't flourish, and it, it shouldn't win any victories. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be powerful. But, but God says, I'm going to raise you up, and I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people, and I'm going to be like a father to you. And all the nations of the world are going to look, and they're going to they're know with their eye that, that there's something different about this people. And, and, of course, it was all setting up and establishing for the moment when Christ would come, and there would be a unique, distinct difference between those who live by faith and those who do not, right? It was all, it was all a, a type. It was all to, to, to be a foreshadowing of the church of Jesus Christ to come. But, the, but Israel got distracted. And, and before, they, before you realize it, they're, they're worshiping false gods and they're engaged in sexual perversion and all sorts of foolishness. And so God allows these judgments to begin to come to get their attention. Now, in Isaiah, from chapter 40 on, we start to see a transition that takes place. From, from chapters 1 through 39, they deal predominantly with the burdens of judgment. And, and we've kind of talked about that a lot. Like, we just see some really strong language and some really harsh things that begin to happen to the nation, right? But when you start at chapter 40, you're going to notice that I, God begins to change the message. God, through Isaiah... He begins to prophesy about the return of God's people from captivity. He begins to speak to them more and more about their purpose and their calling, as we're talking about. And, and so what I see, I see this from chapter 40 on through the rest of the chapter of, uh, book of Isaiah. I see this as a revelation of what God desires his corrective actions to accomplish. He reveals it. So from, from 1 to 39, we see his judgment. We see his corrective action. But from 40 on, we see the desire of God, what he wants to come out of it. And today, I'm just telling you that I think the reason we're preaching this again for the, for the fifth week in a row is because we have to get it today. We have to recognize today what God's doing. He is getting our attention. And, and I, I really feel like this. I don't want to be overdramatic, but I feel like if we miss this during this season of time, we're, we're going to be no different than the children of Israel who walked around the wilderness 40 years. And, and I believe, unfortunately, there will be churches and Christians who will just, they, won't, they don't want to see it. They don't, want to, they don't want to see it the way God's revealed. But as for us, I want to see it. I want to recognize, oh, God, you're getting my attention. You're getting our attention. We do have purpose. 
There, there is, we are supposed to be doing things other than on Sunday. Amen. Wait a minute. We, we are more than just our gatherings. We're, we're beyond the Sunday morning experience. We're, we're beyond just coming together as a congregation. As much as we love that and how, how great of purpose that serves, but we are the church of Jesus Christ on Monday. We are the church of Jesus Christ on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Somebody say amen. Amen. And, and we're beginning to recognize that, that we're the voice in the wilderness once again. There's a wilderness all around us. And once again, just as God always has, he's raising a voice in the wilderness saying, this is the way, repent, follow the Lord. He is the way of hope and life. And now the church is the voice in the wilderness, just as John the Baptist was at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. We have been set apart and called to declare the coming of the Lord. If you and I believe that Christ is coming, then it is time and high time to declare the goodness of God, the mercy of God, that now is the time of repentance. Now is the time to get right with God. And if you don't declare it, who will? Who will? No, that's our calling. That is our purpose on the earth today. So I want to give a a historical background really quick before we start to dissect those seven verses that we read. Hezekiah is now the king. And so we talked a little bit about this on Wednesday, but Hezekiah cries out to God for help against the Assyrian army. Predominantly, we've been talking in the first 39 verses about Assyria, right? Right? They're just, they've, they're just a thorn in their flesh. And so they're, they're conquering parts of the nation, and they come in, and they come out. And ultimately, Hezekiah, they form an alliance, basically try to pay them off so that they'll quit bombarding and destroying their nation and, and doing things to their families. And, and that, of course, never works because you can never make peace with enemies. You know, when I, when I read that, sometimes I think of the correlation of what the church has tried to do over the last 20 or 30 years, we, we tried and we've tried to just be, to be really tolerant, you know, because that's what we're supposed to do. We're just supposed to be really tolerant. That's what Christians do. We're tolerant. And, 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 we're, and because we're kind, we just, we lower our, our standards and we, and, and we just, we allow people behind pulpits that weren't called and weren't anointed to be behind pulpits. And we put microphones in singers' hands who were, who were singing on Sunday, but were fornicating on Monday. And we were okay with it because they were gifted and they brought in the crowds and, and we, and we were bringing in all sorts of things that were worldly. And we were using Bill Gates models to build the church. And we were using the model of Apple as a corporation to make, to make our gatherings larger and the reality is you can never make peace with your enemies it's never going to work out good in the end because because the the thing jesus sent out the 12 and then he sent out the 70 he said listen i'm going to send you out be harmless as doves but you also better be wise as serpents and 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 we got the we got the harmless as doves down really good over the last few years but we but we weren't very wise and we, we thought that if we made enemies, and we thought if we lowered the standard, and if we wouldn't preach, if we would just preach smooth services, and if we, sermons, if we would just tell everyone everything's okay, and if, if we would never talk about sin, and if we would get rid of the blood, and we would remove the cross, and, and if we would do those things, people would come to our churches, and they would just love us. And we're learning that didn't work because they hate us now more than ever. If we'll marry them the way they want to be married and, 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 and we'll accept whatever they tell us about family and how to raise our children, they'll just, they'll just be on our team. Guess what? They're not on our team. It's, that's just not the reality of the way it works. And, and, and so that's what Israel thought with Assyria, but it didn't work. And so Assyria comes once again, and we read it on Wednesday night. But ultimately, Hezekiah cries out to the Lord, thanks be to God. And when he did, God sent an angel, and he, he literally just wiped out the entire army of Assyria, 185,000 people. The king of Assyria is then killed by his two sons. So, so needless to say, Assyria, is the, the very judgment that was once upon Israel is now upon Assyria, on Syria, Assyria. And, and, and they're struggling, so they're no longer really a thorn in the, in the flesh 
of Hezekiah and Israel. But, but here's what happens. Hezekiah then does a very foolish thing, and he brings in a delegation of people from Babylon. And he shows them all the treasury and all of the arms of Judah. And that there's just something in the heart, you know, there's, I, 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 I feel like there's just something in the heart of God's people. We just want to be accepted, don't we? We want to look like, dress like, talk like, listen to, watch, everything that the world does. I, I just get that sense. Why would Hezekiah bring in a, a foreign, pagan, ungodly envoy of people and be like, hey, let me show you how wealthy we are. Look at all of the gold we have in our temple. Look at all of the things. Look at our military might. Come in and just explore it all. Kind of like what we see happening in America today. But the problem is Isaiah walks in after this and he looks Hezekiah in the eye, the prophet of God, and he says, one day Babylon is going to return, but when they do, they're going to carry away all of this wealth along with the people themselves. And within 100 years, it happens. Within 100 years, Israel finds itself under Babylonian control. So with that in mind, I want you to consider what Isaiah is now speaking in the 43rd chapter. That's, that has not happened yet, but is going to happen. Okay. Now, let's go back, and I want you to begin to read verse 43 with me again as we just break this down. That's all we're going to do today. We're just going to break this down, and then... And then, and then we'll be finished, but I believe it'll give us a word, a word of comfort. Listen, listen to what it says. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and before, fear not, for I have redeemed you. The very first thing that God speaks out of this chapter is comfort to his people. The Lord comforts his people. In light of more trials ahead, he's, he's not suggesting that things are just going to be great. We, we know what's going to happen. It's already been... It's already been prophesied. They're going to go into bondage. They're going to go into captivity. But in light of that, he says, it's okay because I have a future beyond that. I, I, there, there's still some corrective action that's going to take place, but I have, God has the ability to see even beyond what we're dealing with today. I believe that's true even now, don't you? Don't you believe that God, God may look on the earth today and say, look, the days ahead may be a little difficult, but I can see beyond that. And, and sometimes the church has to be the people who have the ability to see beyond what is happening right now and recognize that we have a God who cares for us and comforts us and, and, and that he will do the same for us just as he did for Israel. And he is preparing them for the future. Think about it. He's speaking life into them in this entire chapter. He's just he's speaking life and he's, he's speaking faith into their hearts because he knows they're going to need it. He says, fear not, F fear not, I'm, I'm going to be with you. I want you to consider how many times throughout scripture, God comes to his people to reassure us. I think that we're safe to say that God is doing the same to his church today. The same message, it's so clearly portrayed throughout scripture. So I, can, I, I feel like I can stand on solid ground and say to you today, that if you want to know what God is speaking to the church of Jesus Christ today, at least one thing that God is speaking to you and to me today, the true church of Jesus Christ, and that's this, fear not. Fear not. Fear not. Don't be debil debilarized. Don't be, don't be overcome. Don't be, don't be seized by fear. Fear not. He's saying it again in our generation. We always need that fresh reminder, don't we? That it's not, now is not the time to fear. The Holy Spirit is shouting, in my opinion, to the church of Jesus Christ, fear not. You know why? One, because God doesn't want his people under the bondage of fear. Fear is a bondage. We know that fear terrorizes. But, the, but, but one of the things I think is so important that God doesn't want us to fear because a lot of times dumb and foolish decisions are made when we're under the veil of fear. And, and if, if we're not careful, the church will make some foolish decisions. And I've watched it over the last few weeks. I, I'm not going to be the guy that just stands up and says, I told you so. I don't think that's, that's necessary. But I've watched, and, and in my opinion, it's out of fear. 
It's just, there's a fear response from an election and, and, and from an idol that's been toppled and, 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 and there's fear and there's people even, I just read something the other day and still thinking somehow that Trump's coming back to office. Why? Why? What causes a person to believe that way? Fear. There is a fear in the heart. How can God move under a new administration? How, how could God move with Democrats having the majority? It just isn't possible. God cannot move in this situation. God is not able to do the weakness. This, this isn't possible. That's, that's the only thing that it can come from, folks. And, and God is standing and yelling and shouting, at church, don't fear! I've got it all under control. I'm doing a work. I'm doing a work in my church. I'm revealing idolatry. I'm revealing wrong devotion. I'm, I'm, I'm exposing sin that's in my church that I can't stand. Because when I return, I will return for a bride, a bride that is pure, a bride that is spotless, a bride that is in love with me and no other, Jesus says. And until that happens, I will not return. And so I will send whatever is necessary to cleanse her and wash her and purify her. And that's happening right now in America. It's happening in America. And I'm just going to warn anyone else, if, you, if you're so stuck on politics, it is an idol in your home, and you will not enter the gates of heaven while worshiping at another altar. That's true. Be careful where you're worshiping. Yo, pastor, that's not me. How much time are you spending talking about Jesus versus talking about politics? How much time are you spending encouraging the word of God and the promises of God versus your political ideology and your thoughts and your theories for America as a whole? Because here's the hard truth. Anything that you're elevating above your devotion to God is an idol. And whether you realize it or not, you think your idols are hidden, but they're exposed to the world. They're exposed before everyone. You're not hiding it. It's right there. You're putting it out in front of everybody to see. It's not hidden anymore. And God's doing us a great, great merciful favor by showing us where our devotions are. And all the while, while he's doing that, he says to the church, fear not. Fear not, abide under the shadow of the Almighty. In Isaiah 43, verse 18, he says this, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You see, the way I see what things are going on around us culturally, politically, as a society, it looks like a desert to me. It looks like a wilderness. It looks like darkness. But my God says, I will make a road in the wilderness. I will bring springs of water in the midst of the desert. And I will bring light that will overcome all darkness. My question to you is, how will your God, the God of miracles, the God of supernatural power, the God of wonders and miracles and majesty, how will he perform unless there's darkness all around us? See, we all want a miracle, but we don't want to be put in a position where we need one. We all want to see the sovereign hand of God move in our midst, but we don't want to be put in a position where that's all we have left. That's not how God works. It never was, never will be. God is saying to us today, I get great comfort in this. Listen, I'm, I, I'm doing a new thing. You, you, you thought I needed certain people and certain positions and certain things to happen, but I'm about to show you I don't need nobody. I don't need man. 
I don't need, I don't need them. I don't, I, I'm God. Like, get your attention on me. I'm tired of everyone else getting the attention. I'm about to be the center. I'm about to be center stage. I'm about to be the one with the microphone. I'm about the one that's going to get the praise and the honor and the glory because I'm God. I've been doing it all along anyway. I'm about to do a new thing, he says. And he says, I will make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. We have preached easy believism in America for way too long. You know what an easy believism is? That means you can be a super... From the beginning of the book, a Christian or a follower of God has been defined as someone who has faith. Right? We see that through the story of Abraham. The story of Abraham is that Abraham is the father of faith. The Bible teaches us clearly that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Easy believism says you can be a Christian, but you really don't have to ever have any faith. You know, you got a great job, you got great health care, you got money back for your future and your 401k, your body's fine, your family's fine, everything's good. The, the, the biggest thorn in your side is the songs they sing on Sunday morning. You don't like them. And that's the real struggle of persecution, being a Christian in America. They painted the walls and they didn't ask me. Is it true or not? Easy believism. You don't have to, we don't have to trust God for some miracle. And then nobody in this room has trusted God for your, for your next meal. We, we, and we've been told that this is, this is what Christianity really looks like. It's not. It's nowhere found in Scripture. No, we're, 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 we're getting ready. We're on the verge. We're, I think we're kind of there now where we're going to have to put our trust in God. We're going to have to believe God to do things. Not the local lobbyist, not the, not, not the, 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 best, the best, you know, politician of our day. We're going to have to trust God and the power of his spirit. We're going to trust God that he'll do what he promised says he'll do. If God is for us, then the question really does have to be, once again, who can be against us? We're overcomers, according to Scripture. But we can't forget, you can't be an overcomer if there's nothing to overcome. We've been, we've been quoting and declaring ourselves to be overcomers for years, but, but I think if an alien came to the earth, we're like, what are you overcoming? You're the wealthiest people on the planet. You have health care. You have wealth. You have prosperity, blessing. You have everything you need. The church in China is going to... Okay. Overcomers. <laughs> and and we've, just, we've just shut our minds to these things. Like we've just, we've just shut our... Like we've just, we've just shut ourselves in to this, to this idol of Western gospel. That is no gospel. And the Lord's exposing it now. The Lord says in the 30, 43rd chapter, he says, I have called you by your name. Now, folks, this speaks of an intimate involvement from a heavenly king. He says, I know you. I, I know about you. I know all there is. And so I believe that's, that's individually and that's us corporately in the church. Listen, for, for everything that I'm saying... For everything, and it sounds facetious, and it sounds like I'm being critical, and it sounds like I'm being harsh against the American church. Here's the reality, because I cannot go, God loves the American church. God loves the, the American Western Christian church. The same people, listen, the people of Israel ran off to their idols, but God loved them. And God pursued them. And God came after them. And even though I have to say, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm compelled to say some strong things against the American church. The only reason I say it is because I know with everything in me, God loves American church. He loves you. He loves Western Christians. He loves those of us who have experienced prosperity and blessing. Because he says this, I've called you by your name. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that, that yes, maybe, maybe, maybe as a church, collectively, I'm talking collectively as a body of people in America, we've gotten away, but God says, I've still called you by your name. That's what he's saying to Israel, the very people that were backslidden and turned away from God. He says, I've called you by your name. I'm intimately involved as your heavenly king. 
he says these words, and if you have any kind of pen, marker, highlighter, you should write, you should just highlight this. You are mine. So for all of her falls, all of her, all, all of her blemishes, all of her weakness, Jesus speaks to the church in, the, in, in America, in the United States, and says, that's mine. Do you understand this? He says, that's mine. And, and the only analogy that, that I can think of is like, a jealous boyfriend who, who's just in love with his girl and, and, and some local yokel comes around and some, he just thinks he's going to take her away and no, as, he's, as he sees the flirting starts to take place, the boyfriend's chest gets bigger and his head gets bright and he, and he becomes a little bit more mold and he looks the little boy in the eye and he says, that's mine. You're touching what belongs to me. And I believe that's what's happening in America today. I believe God is looking over the church of Jesus Christ and saying, that is mine. No one else's doesn't belong to anyone else. I died for her. I formed her. I created her. And she is mine. And I will deal with anything or anyone that is trying to take her. Come on, somebody. Say amen. You are mine, the Lord says. This church belongs to Jesus. This body. I was tickled the other day. One of the children's church kids, young, maybe six, I, she came up. And as you see, I love to mess with the kids and get them riled up and then send them back to their parents. And I'm messing with them all and getting them riled up. And this little girl says, hey, hey. She goes, do you own the church? And I said, no, I said, I don't own the church. She goes, yeah, you do. You're the pastor. I said, well, I'm, I, I, I'm kind of just stutter. I don't know what to do. I'm like, yes, I am the pastor, but I don't own the church. Well, who owns it? And without thinking, I just said, I said, well, the people own it. I mean, I should have said Jesus owns the church. I would have got her theologically, but she got me. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but it, just, it, was a, it was a question from a child. And it stuck with me, and I'm like, yeah, who does own the church? Do you, first of all, Jesus owns the church. And second of all, the, the church can't be owned because it's us. It's you. It's, it's each one of you who are true followers of Jesus. You are the church. And God says to us, you are mine. You don't belong to anyone else today. You, you don't. You don't have other lovers. You don't have other affections. You have one devoted relationship, and that's with your Savior, Jesus Christ. If that's you, come on. Would you put your hands together and say amen? Then he gives us promises after that. After, after that first verse, and starting in verse 2, God gives us promises that are superior to our fears. I want you to get that this morning. We've got to believe that the promises of God are superior to our fears. So God doesn't just say to us, don't fear, but instead he gives us promises that will calm our fears. For example, he says, when you pass through the waters. So yes, there will be some more corrective action. It, it, it may not be easy in the future, I don't know. But regardless of that, what we do know is God is saying, I will be with you. So no matter what tomorrow holds, God himself has promised to be with us. Do you see it? Every one of you, no matter what your tomorrow holds, God has bound himself to his word, speaking to his church, saying, you are mine, and because you are mine, I don't want you to fear, and the reason I don't want you to fear is you don't need to know what tomorrow holds. You just need to rest in the reality that I will be with you tomorrow. Just as I'm with you today, I will be with you tomorrow. The question becomes, do we believe God? And is this, the fact that God himself is with us, is that enough? If you're writing notes, write this down. The proportion of your faith dictates the promise you receive. The proportion of your faith dictates the promise you receive. If you do not believe the promise, you're not going to be established by it. You can read this 15 times, you can put it on your refrigerator door, you can quote it, you can memorize it, but if you don't believe it, it's never going to be established and become a true reality in your life. 
But if you receive it with a childlike confidence, accepting it as true, then his word is going to bring you joy. His word is going to bring peace. There is going to be hope in your heart, and fear will ultimately be overcome. So the question is, do you believe today that you are God's, that you belong to him, and that, yes, you may pass through the water, and you may go through the river, and you may go through the fire, but through it all, God will be with you. He will walk with you and keep you and sustain you and watch over you. Verse 3, God establishes very clearly who he is. He says, I am the Lord your God. He's speaking here about idol worship. In other words, he's saying, I'm the only one. I'm the Lord. There's no one there like me. There, there, this other stuff that you're giving your attention to and your focus and you're placing your trust in, they do not compare to who I am. God says, look, don't remember what I've done for you. Don't remember how much you as a people mean to me. God says, I've allowed things to take place in order to position you where I wanted you. Do you believe that this morning? I, that's something that you have to question in your heart. Do you believe that in your own life and corporately as a church, that at this season in which we're in right now, God has allowed things to take place in order to position us exactly where he wants us? And even though at times I look over the church and I think, man, we have a lot of areas that we need to correct. The reality is God has us right where he wants us. He's doing a work. He's, he's, he's extracting some things. He's, he's, he's bringing some things out. He's purifying the gold. He's getting rid of some dross. And he's, he's doing it exactly in his right time. And the same is true in your life. You may look and you're always, if you're not careful, saying, I'm not where I want to be. I'm not where I should be. I'm not this. I'm not that. But the reality is God is positioning you right where he wants you. You're precious. That's what it says. Do you, do you, do you see it in verse 4? Verse 4. Yes, verse 4. Since you were precious in my sight. Now notice in, in Isaiah, he's saying, look, I shifted and controlled some events in other nations, and I moved some chess pieces as it is to position you where I wanted you. That's what's happening for the church of Jesus Christ in America today. And we act like, we act like the chess pieces are the most important, but the reality is it's the chessboard that God has all control of. Does that make sense? Like, he's allowing some things to happen. And, and he's doing it to get the church right where he wants her to be. He says, you're precious to me. That means you're important. But not only are you individually important, today the reality is you are important to fulfilling the purposes of God. And this is where we have to, we're going to close in just a minute. You have to get this last point. It's the climax of this sermon. You have to get this in your spirit. Today, you have to recognize that God himself has established that all kingdom advancement on earth is going to take place through the church. Souls are going to be saved through the efforts of the church. The gospel is going to be declared through the church across the globe. Not, all different types, different languages, different colors, different cultures, vessels and tools all across the globe but that there's not there's no angel coming to declare the gospel there there's there's no reincarnation of john the baptist you're it there's no plan b the church either as it is now or as god will raise her up will be the tool that god uses to see people set free to see people delivered to see people healed, both physically, literally, and spiritually. Do you understand that? And so when God says, you're precious to me, one, he's saying, you're precious to me. Like, I love you. I love you. I love you for you. I created you. I love you. He's precious. And, and we've preached that until, until, until we almost choke on it. Like, by now, everyone should know you're precious. We, we've, we've told you that for a lot of years. Y'all precious. 
But it means something beyond that. He says, you're precious. In other words, you're important. I, God says, I, I have already set it in motion. I, I, he can't go back on his word. I've already established that you are going to build my church. You're going to do it. Not pastors by themselves, not called laity, not people that you pay a salary to. You are. You're the church. You are precious. You are the ones that are going to tell the little young lady that today is a single mother and struggling and just scared to death because she's being bombarded by foolishness and lies from the media and she doesn't know what tomorrow holds, but she's never heard the true gospel. You are going to tell her. You, you are going to be the one that walks alongside someone who's struggling with anxiety and depression. It's you. You are precious. Do you understand this today? This, this, is, this is what the church exists for. And this is why God himself is saying to Israel, you're precious. You see, at the time this was written, he's saying to Israel, you're precious because out of you is going to come my son. I'm not going to let you die. You're going, to go, you're going to go through some hard punishment, and there's going to be some severing, and there's going to be some pruning, and there's going to be loss, and there's going to be a hard, hard, difficult season. But I'll promise you this, Israel will still stand because my son is coming to earth one day, and he's going to walk the streets of Jerusalem, and he's going to declare salvation for all humanity. So I guarantee you Israel is going to survive. That's what God's saying. But guess what? That same promise... It's for us, the church of Jesus Christ. You may suffer. You may go through difficult... There may be legislation against certain speech. I get it. I know what you're all afraid of. I, we don't know. I don't know what the future... There may be a rise against religious freedoms and begin to pull them away. And they, but I'll promise you this, with every ounce of energy I have, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ will not prevail. We'll go to jail and we'll preach the gospel in jail and multitudes will get saved in the prison. We will preach the gospel as we get scattered from our homes and lose our possessions and our finances and our freedoms, but we will declare the goodness and the grace and the power of God. That's why we're in a severing season, because some of you are like, not me, I ain't doing that. I'm just going to bow to the king. That's your choice. But as for us, we're not going to bow. And, and, oh, king, you may put us in the furnace, but if, 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 if you do, our God will deliver us. And there will be another season where the ungodly rulers around us look into the furnace fire and say, did we not cast three men in there? And yet there's four, and he looks as the son of man walking around the fire. That's, that's what he says. When you walk through the fire, you're not going to be burned. That's the promise. That's the promise of God to the church of Jesus Christ. It's what he tells us today. And God says, I'm moving things and I'm shifting them in such a way that I'm setting you up to reveal my glory and reveal my goodness and, and further my kingdom in ways that, that to be quite honest, you, you got tired and you got, you got comfortable and, and could I just say you got lazy and you got complacent and, and you got to thinking that the kingdom of God was something other than it was and you thought you needed to build your kingdom when I was calling you to build mine, but I'm getting ready to disrupt all of that and I'm getting ready to bring you into a place where you finally are utilized the way I want you to utilize, be utilized because you're my church. But as powerful of a word as this was to Israel, I want you to consider Romans 8.32 to the church. Romans 8.32 says to the church of Jesus Christ, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 
See, in Isaiah 43, he says, I used Egypt, and I used Sheba, and Ethiopia was my tool, and I positioned things, and I moved things around, and, and I caused other armies to be defeated, and I gave men on your behalf, and, and that's cool, and that's encouraging, but, but it's nothing like the promise of 832 when God himself says, yeah, forget Egypt, and forget Sheba, and forget the nations of the world. I sent my only son, my only begotten son to come to the earth uh, so that he could be mocked and ridiculed and die and shed his blood on your behalf. You don't think I'm going to sustain you in the days ahead when the fire is raging, when the waters are rising? Of course I will. You see, it's established on a better promise, the promise of his own son, Jesus Christ. So we have to recognize this today and begin to take, pl- take part in what we are truly called to do. This is the message, the message that, that is the end result, if you will, of the divine correction, the end purpose, the end result, the thing that God wants us to understand, to remember, and that is that what it was to Israel, it is to us today. I'm your God, you're my people. He says this, you are my witnesses. At the end of it all, that's the message that you and I have to get today. As they get ready to come and sing, listen to me. i got to say it again. At the end of it all, the reason God brings correction, the reason we're experiencing judgment, the reason we're seeing things on the earth the way we are today is so the church will wake up to the simple, childlike reality that you and I are God's voice and witnesses on the earth. Listen to what he says in verse 10. You are my witnesses, says the Lord. And my servant whom I've chosen, that you may know and believe, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed. Therefore you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. In verse 44, he reiterates it. Do not fear, do not be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declare it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Do you see the message that God himself is screaming to the church? He's saying, get off of all of your other affections and recognize your divine supernatural calling you are my witnesses you're my voice you're my hands you're my feet you're my tools you are my witnesses to reveal to the world there's no other god but jesus somebody say amen and give god praise let's stand all over this building you are the witnesses Is that not exactly what Jesus speaks to the church in Acts chapter 1 when he says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit? We've prostituted the things of God. We've tried to use the Holy Spirit for our own purposes and our own kingdoms. We've tried to use our influence to to persuade political powers. We've we've tried to come up with our own ideas and thoughts of, of what the purpose of the church of Jesus Christ is. When all the while, it's, it's very, very clear. The Spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach deliverance to the poor to set at liberty those that are captive to share and proclaim the good news of the gospel is that not what Jesus established when he came to the earth of course it is and then he says I've started it I'm now going to empower you with my Holy Spirit to complete it. That's the purpose of the church. We're witnesses. God help us to see it and help us to get back to just being his witnesses every day. Wherever I live, wherever I go, whatever I'm engaged in, help me to be your witness. Folks, there's a refining that's taking place. It's, it's all in the hands of God. Because there are people in the church today in America that don't want what I'm preaching. 
Jesus knows that. They don't want this. They didn't sign up for this. They were listening to my sermon. They'll listen to this sermon. I'll say, this guy's a crazy. He's a, no, I didn't sign up for that. No, God loves me. I'm precious in his sight. He wants me to do well in life. God, God, and all of a sudden now they're building their own idea of what kingdom looks like. We've played into it for way too long. I, I didn't sign up for this. I, I, what do you mean? I don't, that's not my thing. I, I, I pay money in the offering. You preach. Leave me alone. I'm going to do my thing. You do yours. You're the preacher. You preach. I'm sorry. That's not how it works. It's not reality. You're the witnesses. I'm the witnesses. We're together. We're witnesses to reveal to the lost and dying world around us that there's but one God, one way of heaven. Can I ask you to pray with me this morning as we close out? Father, we ask you today, let the refining continue. Starting in our own hearts. Remove the impurities from us. Take away our misguided affections. We ask you to cleanse us, Lord, so that we could be your witnesses, so that we would see in the hour in which we live, that we would see it and experience it with our own eyes, the sick being healed, deaf ears being opened, spiritual blindness giving way to spiritual sight, that we will see as you've called us, that we will see scorpions and serpents being trampled on, we will experience the manner, all manners of the devil and the oppression of evil being broken over the hearts and lives of the people you love around us. That we will see the poor and the more marginalized helped. They will see and know and experience God's love because we are living, walking witnesses for you. They're going to sing play. I think now is a great time for us to come before the Lord. If you have any desire, no, let's just do this. If you have any desire to just be a witness for God and do better at being a witness, will you just step out of your seat, come forward, find a place at the altar, you can kneel, and you're going to pray, and then we'll all end together praying. But come on, if you have any desire, you just say, yeah, I, I want to be a witness. I may go through some fire. I may get a little bit of slack and that, but I want to be a witness. Come on, and then we'll pray together. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you did, like and share this video so we can help spread God's word. If you'd like to know more about The Bridge or you'd like to give, visit us at our website at thebridge129.org. Again, thank you so much for watching with us. Until next time, God bless.